Well, much of the debate around our deficit focuses on taxes. Are they too much, too little, or just not well spent? At this year's Economic Outlook Conference, I sat down with the Dean of OCU's Minders School of Business, Jonathan Wilner, to talk about free enterprise, our tax code, and why pretty can be deceiving. We have a country that's sort of obsessed with appearances now. Um, the details of what is considered a really cool gift for your 16-year-old daughter in Dallas drive me crazy. But we've become a nation obsessed with appearances, so it has to look right. Well, that's the sort of thing that our automobile industry did there in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when Toyota and Honda came in, and what they had was really reliable cars, things that worked right, got good gas mileage, and they held up across time. Our car companies got obsessed with fit and finish. Doesn't it look nice? By the 1980s, our car companies are toast. They need to be protected by our government in the form of voluntary export restraints. People figured out that the substance of these cars was vastly more important than the color of the paint on the outside. The same thing is true with economic development. The baseline, the stuff that's behind the scenes, the ugly, gritty, dirty work is the necessary condition for growth. So you can have a really beautiful arena, but if people can't get there, it doesn't matter. If the arena is there, people can get there, and it's a hideous monstrosity, you can still sell it out. I give you the Boston Red Sox in Fenway Park. They keep selling it out, and this thing is a dinosaur. There are seats that are behind a vertical iron pillar, and I will pay $60 to get that seat because I want to watch the Red Sox, even if it is an old stadium. It's the people that matter. It's the nitty-gritty that gets you economic development. I've heard you say that Americans need to get real about what free markets can and what they cannot do. What yeah. do you mean by that? Um, free markets is generally all the models that people talk about. What they mean when they say free markets is actually perfectly competitive markets. It's quite a bit different. So a monopoly, a local monopoly, say, um, in a city with power, is not necessarily a perfectly competitive market, though it well could be a free market. And the outcomes that people project for perfectly competitive markets are the sorts of things that I want. Great efficiency, higher income, growth. That's all perfectly competitive markets. But most of the time what we have in this country is quasi-free markets that are not perfectly competitive. The consequence of that is we don't get the outcomes of the perfectly competitive market, though we pretend as if that's going to happen. It's simply not the appropriate one. Uh, airlines are a perfect example. This is an oligopoly. The prices are not what they would be if they were perfectly competitive. And we have huge amounts of evidence to suggest the mergers that have taken place with these airlines has actually raised the prices to the consumer, it's reduced the number of flights, and that's led to economic inefficiency. Are these airlines profitable now? Mm, sort of. They blame the unions, the unions blame somebody else, and Southwest is making a killing. So that suggests that what's happened with these so-called major airlines is not perfect competition. If it was perfect competition, they'd be acting like Southwest. They'd have happy, well-paid employees, they would hit their own time and their customers would like it. Instead, what we have is a few majors who keep merging and keep being inefficient. And that tells you right there, that whole industry is not perfectly competitive. The feeder to them is airplanes. There's really only two companies, Boeing and Airbus. There's a few smaller ones, CRJ and Embraer, coming in. But that's an oligopoly there as well. These are not perfectly competitive markets. We need to start designing policy that addresses the fact that these aren't perfectly competitive markets. They are imperfectly competitive markets. Therefore, our policies should deal with reality, not some sort of ideal. Let's talk about taxes, if we can. Could higher taxes on our nation's highest earners, could it slow down our economy? It might, but probably not very much. Um, some of the arguments that people use, it's basically what's called the Laffer Curve, is that if you raise the tax rates on the very rich, then they will do one of two things. One, they will work less, and two, they will invest less in their business. And when economists think of investment, they think of real investment. This is not playing on the stock market. This is actually buying new plant and equipment, not buying an existing one. That's what makes an economy grow, real investment, new plant and equipment. That's what we need. 
Well, if you raise their tax rates, most of the non-trust baby types don't work any less. If you lower them, they won't work anymore. Quite simply, they love working. They work 80 hours a week, pretty much regardless of a change in a couple of thousand, twenty thousand, hundred thousand dollars a year for these people. They're going to keep working that way because that's the type of people they are. A few might back off, but not much. In terms of investment, well, quite frankly, they're just not doing a heck of a lot of it right now anyway. You can see all that money sitting on the sidelines watching. Well, it's not doing anything. It is a scary proposition from an economist because all that money, about $1.6 trillion worth of it, is sitting in the banks waiting to flood the economy. So hopefully we've got a dam built up and we won't have a spike of inflation as a result of the sudden increase in investment in the future. In the debate over the taxes, are we actually missing the boat when we don't talk about what we're doing? doing with those taxes? No, oh, absolutely. The, the whole idea of any business and any government, when it comes to the finances, to look at both sides of the equation. The spending, well, what are we going to buy? The cost of it is what do we have to pay to get it? And what you want to do in business and hopefully in government, but no guaranteed, is to be thoughtful in what you're doing so you have a net positive. That's why this fiscal cliffs bother, bother people, is that they recognize a 10% across the board cut to everything is probably not the best solution. Some places maybe you can cut 20%, others you don't even want to cut, and you want to balance that. Then you want to balance that against the cost. Okay, how are we going to raise some money to help offset that? What's the most efficient way to do it? Recognizing that if we cut expenditures and we cut taxes, then things are going to change. What's going to give us the best result? What combination of them is going to get the best result? And what defines the best result is part of what the argument is about. Where are we trying to go as a country? What are we trying to achieve? There isn't uniform agreement on that. Thank you, Dr. Wilmer. Thank you.